Let's pray before we get into this morning's message. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How's your Bible reading going? We are in the dog days of summer, but we are no longer in the dog days of the prophets. Uh, we get to jump into the wisdom literature. So if you're on the same track as I am, and I know that there's several different tracks going on, don't worry about that. I just finished Job this week, um, and uh, let's see, I think Proverbs, well, Psalms was like one day, because for my schedule, I read a psalm a day, um, so wrap, wrapping up the first time through the psalms, and then Actually, this reading plan, you go through the Psalms uh, one and a half times in the course of a year, I believe, is how it works out. Um, and then on to Proverbs. So last Sunday, uh, we talked about the book of Proverbs as we are jumping into the wisdom literature. And I do hope and pray that you, like me, are benefiting from creating a new habit the habit of getting into the scriptures each and every single day. Um, and if you haven't, uh, there's still half a year available to develop this habit. And so I'd encourage you, uh, just pick up where we're at. Start in on Proverbs um, and start reading uh, each single, every single morning or afternoon or lunchtime. Or maybe you need the app that reads it to you because you have a lot of windshield time in your life and you have time there that you could use the app for it to read to you there's all sorts of options but the goal is to get the word of god to be in us just be part of us part of how we think part of our worldview the challenge is to get all the way through the old testament which if you're doing it you're finding holy cow it's long right <laughs> like two-thirds of the bible like I said last week, we won't even get to a sniff of Jesus. I mean, we get sniffs here and there in the mosaic of the Messiah in the Old Testament. But we won't start reading about Jesus until late August. That's how big the Old Testament is. All right, so wisdom literature. Last week, Proverbs. Proverbs is this uh, great book with all this pithy wisdom and so in Sunday school, it was mentioned uh, Proverbs, uh, what is it, 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight, which we interpret to mean awesome, right? It's probably how we interpret that. that life will go well. And then you flip a few pages, and you are introduced to Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is this troubling little book of 12 chapters. And really the trouble with Ecclesiastes is that Ecclesiastes, the teacher, is troubled with Proverbs. Because what has happened for the teacher in Ecclesiastes is that he has seen a bit of life. Picture him as, oh, I don't know, a 50-year-old preacher. And... He's noticed that there are people who trust in the Lord with all their heart, lean not on their own understanding, and their paths aren't so straight. That terrible things happen to people, that pain and suffering seems to come for the righteous and the wicked. And you could maybe even argue the righteous, it feels, are more often the target of pain and suffering. In Ecclesiastes, the teacher sees this world and he's troubled. He's a critic. He's a cynic even. And he begins to put pen to paper. He get, begins to come up with these sayings. One of them was turned into a song, I believe, in the 60s before I was born. To everything, turn, turn, turn. Now, some of you will only be humming that the rest of the message, you hippies. <laughs> you defiant hippie, Gaby. 
<laughs> it is a good song. So Ecclesiastes. This is the structure of Ecclesiastes, pretty simple. Chapter 1, verse 1 is an introduction. It's a heading that introduces us to the book of Ecclesiastes. And actually, it introduces us to the teacher. It says this, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. And so it introduces us to the teacher. In the Hebrew, it's Kohelet. And there's a big argument as to does it mean teacher, does it mean preacher, does it mean prophet, does it mean, eh, nobody ever argues for prophet really, does it mean professor, what does this word Kohelet mean? And then from verse 2 all the way through chapter 12 verse 8 you get the sayings of the teacher. <coughs> so all of those chapters are the teacher thinking about life reflecting upon a lifetime of examples that contradict at points and are different than what Proverbs says. Actually, contradict is too hard of a word, and we'll see why in a moment. So in verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 9, the author of the book comes back and tells us, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. And so these words that are rather cynical, rather dark, rather troubling, that make up the majority of the book, the author here in chapter 12 says are wise and good for you to hear. In chapter 12, the author goes on and he says, the sayings of the wise are like goads. They are sharp and hurt and penetrate. They are difficult for us to hear. But you need to hear them. You see, one of the problems that all of us have is we believe in the American dream. <laughs> Why do I say that as a problem? I have a wife. I have more than 2.5 children. I don't have a dog, but I have six cats. <laughs> They're not really mine. I just let them live at the premises. But I do occasionally like them. I have two cars. I have central air. I have a comfortable existence. I also, by the way, have a beautiful brand new guitar. Have you seen it? <laughs> don't touch it. without permission. We all believe that life should go well. We all believe that it should continue to get better. That last year should be not as good as this year. That every year should get better. That everything should look up we believe this for a myriad of reasons. One is that we live in the most prosperous nation in the world. As I've said before, we live in the Disneyland of world history. We live in this place that kings and queens throughout history would look at us and go, Oh my gosh, are you royalty? You have a flushing toilet. That is amazing. You have running water. You bathe daily, perhaps more than once a day? That's amazing. With hot, on-the-spot water? Oh, my goodness. I mean, you can just hear the kings and queens and the prince and the princes from ages ago saying, look at this, look at this contraption. You turn the knob and... We live in the Disneyland of world history and we don't even know it. We are unawares. And we think that life should go well. Then we also throw on a religious veneer on this as well. We throw on a religious thinking that if we follow God, then we should get something out of that arrangement. He is lucky to have us. And because we are following Him and we are faithful to Him, he should, in turn, bless us. So we pray for blessing. 
Lord, bless me. Lord, keep me. Lord, guide me. Lord, help me. Lord, grant me traveling mercies. Lord, protect me. Lord, keep my kids safe. Lord, protect everyone that's on the road when Bailey's driving. (laughs) These are little tests to see if she's listening to my sermons as she's gone. We believe that life should go well. And we believe that there are guarantees. We believe that we are guaranteed in some way a good, safe, blessed life. That God is somehow on the hook that if we are faithful and we are following Him, that He will bless us guaranteed. I remember the very first time that this notion of mine was challenged intellectually, which is very different than emotionally. The first time this was challenged intellectually for me, I was in high school, and a pastor by the name of uh, Dr. Means, I can't remember his first name now, I apologize, but Dr. Means, who taught at Denver Seminary, was a longtime pastor at Southern Gables Evangelical Free Church, came to our church, and he started his message by saying, God owes you nothing. There are no guarantees. My ears perked up. 16 years old. What do you mean? What are you talking about? And by the way, I lived, I, 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 I attended a very robust, theologically minded, honest endeavor, honestly inquiring kind of a church. I did not attend a church that taught If you follow God, he'll bless you. He'll give you stuff. Send in your seed and the Lord will send you more money. It's not how my church worked. And we made fun of people like that on television. We thought that was ignorant. Simple-minded. But as he started to talk about his wife's breast cancer, as he started to talk about his life in ministry following Jesus, as he started to talk about how she died, even though they were pastoring a church of over a thousand members and those people prayed. There were people who came to him and said, you just didn't have enough faith. Your wife didn't have enough faith. And somehow those people left with all of their teeth in their mouth. Because if they had said that to this pastor, I probably wouldn't be a pastor anymore. That was the first time it was intellectually challenged for me. The first time it was emotionally challenged for me was when I was a student at Denver Seminary. And a couple down the street at the corner had been praying and wanting a child, and they had a child. We woke one morning to ambulances, firefighter, police. The baby had died in the night. Me and another seminarian, we lived next door. We were in Dr. Means' class on pastoral care. He told us, Even a fool is considered wise if he keeps his mouth shut. There is nothing that you can say that will help people in their moment of grief. Do not show up like you have the answers. We knew better than that. We went, we hugged, we cried, we spoke. The child died gone in the night like a vapor like a mist a cousin of mine later that year would ask me to conduct a funeral for his daughter who had died sleeping before I graduated from seminary Dr. Clyde McDowell a gifted orator If he and I were the choice for your pastor, you'd shoot me out and you'd pick him. He he was diagnosed with cancer of the throat. 
This man ate healthy when it was only Californians that ate healthy. Before it was a thing. He worked out, he ate healthy, he did all the right things, and cancer took his voice away. It's how he made his living. At the end of his life, he scribbled on notes to communicate to his wife and kids. And he died the week I graduated from Denver Seminary. That same week, my good friend and mentor, Ken West, was diagnosed with lymphoma. He was a little slow. He had been in seminary for 10 years. He was 10 years older than me, and we were graduating in the same class from seminary. And Ken was full of life. And he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. The weak He's graduating from seminary. He would go on for a few years. But by the time we were out here pastoring, Ken would pass. If you've been in my office and you'd seen the picture of the goofy guy with absolutely no facial hair, and it says, love God, love others, nothing else matters, that's Ken. And he died. And those were the challenges to my heart that is this true? Does this Christian thing work? Does this Bible thing work? And I started to get my head around this notion that, huh, there's no guarantees, there's no guarantees. Who is the teacher in Ecclesiastes? Who is the teacher that we're introduced to in chapter 1, verse 1? Well, scholars and people who care, argue, fuss, and fight about this stuff. Some say, I'm not sure why this isn't advancing. Could you get, hey, Caden, could you uh, advance it to two from there? Who is the teacher? Great. We're having technical difficulties again. It's all Hevel. <laughs> we'll get that. Who is the teacher? Some think it's Solomon. There's some good reasons in the text to believe that this is perhaps Solomon. One is that uh, it's a person who it appears at the end of their life or maybe midlife, and they're writing about all these experiences. And so they have wealth, and they have power, and they have influence, and they've given themselves over to the pleasures of the flesh and the world, and, and they have written in light of all of those things their conclusions concerning this world. Another possibility is that it is a royal fictional autobiography. And that's a thing, by the way. That's not scholars just making stuff up. They have actually found other writings in other uh, peoples that are uh, near the Israelites. And it is a genre. Think about it this way. And it's not, by the way, seeking to be deceptive. It's more like a thought experiment. So if you wanted to comment on American politics today, but you wrote in the voice of Abraham Lincoln, because that would be fascinating. What would old Abe have to say about American politics today? What would he have to say about racism? What would he have to say about the divisions in our nation? What would he have to say about the culture wars going on? That would be a fascinating intellectual exercise. And so some scholars believe, based on evidence, that there are these royal fictional autobiographies, that that's what Ecclesiastes, at least the middle section by the teacher, is. It doesn't matter who you conclude it was written by. It does not change the lessons. So what does he say? Well, just in case your day's not going so well, let's start off with Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. I mean, right off the bat, meaningless. 
meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And all the children in, school, in class today are going, amen. Right? right off the bat, we have an interpretive issue. The way you know that there's an interpretive issue is if you go and you consult other versions of the scriptures, other translations, and they all have different words, then you go, huh, something's going on in the Hebrew. So this is the Net Bible. It says, futile, futile, laments the teacher. Absolutely futile. Everything is futile. If you like the King James or the translations in that uh, vein, the ESV is kind of in the vein of the King James here. It says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The trouble with that translation is when we think of the word vain, we think of pride. We think of vanity, we think of a place that we put our makeup on. My grandmother had a vanity. And I would quote to her Ecclesiastes 1-2. Vanity of vanities, Grandma. You're sitting at the vanity of vanities. Right off the bat, we are introduced to an interpretive issue in the text. The underlying Hebrew is this word hevel. And it literally means breath or vapor or smoke. My grandfather would smoke a pipe he died because he smoked a pipe. He coughed up lots of things when we'd go visit with him. It was like his lungs were trying to come out of his body. It was an unpleasant experience. Because of that, I never took up pipe smoking. I thought for this sermon I should, but I didn't. So if you're interested in essential oils, I brought this thing. There's some sort of downdraft that's causing my hevel to go down but can you see the mist the vapor the smoke the hevel that's what hevel is it's vapor smoke is it a thing does it exist yeah you can see it it's right there but can you grab it? Can you hold it? Can you make it do what you want it to do? I'm trying, I have to hold it up like this because it's not going up into the air like I want it when it's down here. It's acting like hevel. And that's the word that is translated in the NIV, meaningless. In the Net Bible, futile. In the ESV, vanity. This word occurs 38 times in these 12 chapters. It's a very important concept to get our heads around as we wrestle through how it's being used by the teacher. So the first way it's being used is that it is temporary. It is fleeting. Just like my hevel that I have here. It's temporary. It's fleeting. We see that, for example... Here in Ecclesiastes 2.21, For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who, is, who has not toiled for it. This too is hevel and a great misfortune. It's hevel. This too is meaningless if you have the NIV. This too is vanity if you have the ESV. This too is futile if you have the Net Bible. It's temporary. It's fleeting. Over and over again, the teacher will tell you you're going to die. And that is a profound problem with you thinking that your life will get better and better and better and better. Repeatedly, the teacher will tell you, not only will you die, but you'll probably experience your body betraying you as you get older. And this, too, is hevel. Because as we age, that's when we have money and free time. At least a little more. Wouldn't it be great if we came into the world 
And that first day in the world, we received a watch and a slap on the back because our retirement years were ahead of us. And then we proceeded to work. Wouldn't it be great if life was backwards and kids showed up with jobs? And those of us who had the children were taking ourselves less seriously. We were taking life less seriously. At one point, we quit talking. And we just kind of hung around and people met our needs and took care of us. I mean, if life was backwards, but it's not. It's hevel. It's temporary. It's fleeting. You know, it's interesting. This word hevel is also translated idols. So there's this semantic range, this this meaning range that we have to take into consideration when the teacher is wanting to use this word hevel. And by the way, Ecclesiastes is poems. And so it's a poem. It's a poet who's pressing metaphors and he's pressing the meaning of words and he's seeking to expand our understanding because otherwise you might not hear this hevel idea with life. So Deuteronomy 32, this is a poem that Moses wrote, actually instructed by God. And it says, They made me, God, jealous by what is no God, little g, and angered me with their hevel, their worthless idols. The reason we know it's idols is because this is a parallelism. And earlier we saw what is no God. So the next line has to further expand the no God idea. And so here the context tells us hevel means a worthless idol. It's temporary. It's fleeting. It appears to have substance. It appears to offer you something, but in the end, it's grasping at straws. Wouldn't that be one of our idioms? Has anybody ever grasped at straws and had troubles getting a hold of them? I don't know what that meaning word means. The second meaning of hevel, absurd or enigma, or paradox. Now, this is important to get our heads around because this one is actually used more often by the teacher than the first one. The first idea of temporary or fleeting is definitely one of the ideas of hevel, and it's often in there. But as you read this little book, you'll also find his use of the word hevel, meaning absurd, or enigma, or paradox. So here's an example. In this hevel life of mine, I have seen both of these. The righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. This is too is hevel. That's absurd. That's a paradox. I I thought that If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding and acknowledge Him, then He will direct your paths. Now, Ecclesiastes isn't saying that his experience is a contradiction. He is saying that his experience presents a paradox. A contradiction would be this. He has all of the information possible, And he knows that the two cannot possibly exist together because they contradict one another. But a paradox is, from my vantage point, this looks like it doesn't work that way. It's a paradox. Have you ever felt like this teacher? You ever had these thoughts? You see, Ecclesiastes is a book that is helpful for the doubting. It is a book that is helpful for the agnostic, for the atheist. It is helpful for us to be honest about our experiences with God. So what should we do with this hevel life of ours? You see, it feels like Ecclesiastes is just really, 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 it feels like it's the Bible book that was written on a Monday morning. It feels like it was the Bible book that 
after a hailstorm or a tornado hits your town, he's like right there to go, see, told ya. That's what Ecclesiastes feels like. What are we supposed to gain from this? Because if we remember, the author says, the teacher and what he has shared with us is wise. It is good for us to consider these things. It is good for us to be reminded that our life is hevel. It is a vapor. It is temporary. It is fleeting. And many times it is a paradox. It is absurd. It is futile. The first thing is he gets really zen on us here. As you read this book, you will find that it is not written by a Westerner. As you read this book, you will realize this is an Eastern book. Where was it written? The Middle West. No, sorry. East. It's very Eastern in its thinking. And so there are six cycles in this 12-chapter book where he will come back around and he will say, it is Hevel, you're going to die. There's chance and it doesn't always go the way you want. You cannot control life, though you think you can. Nothing is going the way you want it to. Ah, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. What are we supposed to do? Enjoy your life. Whatever good things come your way. So eat, drink. Be merry. Enjoy your wife, your husband, your children, your friends. Because you're not ever always guaranteed them. They may not be here tomorrow. You are not guaranteed anything in this life. So at the potluck, chew your food slowly. Savor the flavors. Enjoy the conversation with the people around you. Slow down. Don't be in a hurry because there's those pressing, heavily things that you've got to get to. Second thing, it's a gift from God. Who gave man his taste buds? Who gave food its flavors? Who gave ears to hear and eyes to see? Who gave us the opportunity to be in relationship with people? Whose idea was all of this? Whose idea was it to make babies? Hold them, to coo at them and act like you're a fool, but you don't care because the child is so precious. Whose idea was it to make baby puppies and kittens? Whose idea? It's a gift of God. But too often, too often we are in a hurry, too often we do not stop and gang, my wife's here today. I'm preaching to myself. Too often we expect out of this life more than this life was ever designed to provide. So put away that smartphone and those Instagram photos of that model in the bikini or that friend on the beach in Hawaii or that friend drinking a craft beer when your town doesn't have a craft brewery. <laughs> and enjoy your life. It is a gift from God. I love this quote from Ecclesiastes 5. We see this cycle, one of the six here. This is what I've observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun. Even working hard brings a certain satisfaction. 
even this guy who is clueless with how to work well with my hands. People make fun of me because I like to wash my car, but it's like the one skill I have with my hands. But I feel such satisfaction when it looks pretty. Right? There, there's something about toil and it's labor and it rewards us and it, it's one of those things. And this is said the satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, because that's not always a thing, is it? To accept their lot and be happy in their toil. This is a gift of God. Other people have reflected upon this concept. Blaise Pascal. You may not be able to see this very well. Unless you have bionic eyes. But this is a quote that it would be best you close your eyes and imbibe it. Have it seep in. Blaise Pascal lived in the 1600s, before this hevel of ours country was here. He wrote this, we're never satisfied with the present. We anticipate, how many of you are right now are anticipating something? The end of the sermon. We anticipate the future as too slow in coming. As if we can hasten its course or we recall the past to stop its too rapid flight. Barney and I keep saying, where did our little people go? We are so unwise that we wander about in times which are not ours. And we don't think of the only time which belongs to us. We are so idle that we dream of those times which are no more, and we thoughtlessly overlook the only time that exists. It's because the present is generally painful to us, so we conceal it from our sight because it troubles us. And if it happens to be delightful to us, we regret to see it pass away. He continues. We try to sustain it by the future and try to control matters which are not in our power, preparing ourselves for a time which we have no certainty of reaching. So we should each examine our thoughts and will find that they are all occupied with either the past or the future. We scarcely ever think of the present. And when we do, it is only to take light from it to arrange the future. The present is never our end. The past and the present are our means. The future alone is our end. And so we truly never live, but rather hope to live. And as we are always preparing to be happy, it is inevitable that we should never be so. A mathematician wrote that. Isn't that so true? I mean, I'm intentionally speaking a tad slower today. I'm intentionally wanting you to feel some anxiety today. I want you to feel the hevel. I I want you to feel the need to be in the present, to be present to what's going on, to be present in what's going to transpire today in this building, in this place. I like this quote by Robert L. Short because... There's a hyperlink in Ecclesiastes that is super important for us to see. In short, paves the way for us to consider this. Ecclesiastes is essentially a kind of negative theologian. (laughs) He's a Monday morning theologian. Asking questions that can be answered only by a future revelation of God. 
and clearing the road for this revelation by smashing any and all false hopes to pieces. Ecclesiastes is the Bible's night before Christmas. He shows us human self-sufficiency stretched to its absolute limit and found sadly wanting. Philip Ryken says this, Kohelet, the teacher, shows us the absolute vanity of life without God so that we finally stop expecting earthly things to give us lasting satisfaction and learn to live for God rather than for ourselves. There's this hyperlink. This is a Greek word. It's metaiotenes. Sorry, I said it poorly. Metaiotes. There we go. Metaiotes. It's been a while since I spoke Greek to anyone. It means emptiness, futility, frustration. It's this Greek word that when you look in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible called the Septuagint, this is the word they use for hevel. And this is the word that the Apostle Paul uses in Romans 8, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, futility, emptiness. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Paul is teaching here in Romans 8 that... The world is futile. The world is meaningless. That this hevel feeling exists in this world because of our sin. Without our sin, Ecclesiastes would not be a book. It would not be necessary to write. Our notions that everything would always get better all the time are correct notions, but they are notions for a world that we do not inhabit. They are for a world to come. And the world that we currently live in has been subjected to frustration. It has been subjected to futility because of sinners like you and I. That's why violence goes on and on and on and on. And politicians on the left and right will argue, fuss, and fight. But it's futile. Because the human heart is the problem. And you cannot pass legislation to fix that thing. And so how Riken says, I love this quote. The Bible says that because of our sin, creation itself was subjected to futility. This is why life is always so frustrating. You ever feel it? And sometimes seems so meaningless. Do you ever feel it? If you don't, call me tomorrow morning when you go to work. It is all because of sin. But Jesus suffered the curse of sin in all its futility when he died on the cross. Think of that last phrase. How futile was our sin to destroy Jesus? It could not. How futile were our bombs and bullets to destroy God? They can't. How futile all of our sin is. It is destroyed by self-sacrificial love. It is destroyed by God. Well, you've got to see this Bible project, Project video real quick. Because last week I teased some of you with Proverbs. And this will set us up for Job next week. Here you go. We're exploring three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And they're all asking the question, what does it mean to live well in this world? So we've looked at Proverbs, who you could think of as a bright young teacher. She's all about pursuing wisdom, an attribute of God that's woven into reality. And she's optimistic that if you use wisdom, you will build a successful life. But then we come to Ecclesiastes, who's more like this sharp, middle-aged critic. And he says, You think using wisdom will bring you success. You'd better think again, because life here under the sun is meaningless. 
And that's a phrase he uses a lot in this book. But to understand this book, we have to realize first that we're hearing two voices. So first there's the teacher, and we've been calling him the critic. He's the main voice in the book. But he is introduced to us by another figure, the author. And he's the one who's collected the critic's words and then at the end of the book summarizes everything and gets the final word. So why does the author want us to hear from the critic? Well, he wants to turn your view of the world upside down. And he's going to let the critic explore three really disturbing things about the world. And we should warn you, these are pretty intense. Yeah. So the first is the march of time. Or as the critic says, Generations come and generations go. But the Earth, it's been here long before us and will be long after. No one remembers people from long ago, and all the people yet to come, they too will be forgotten by those who come after them. So, on a cosmic scale, you and I, we are just a blip. Stars are born, and then they die and form planets which orbit new stars, and those planets, they change over time and eventually burn up. And amidst this cosmic backdrop, my entire existence is like a blink in time. Which leads to the critic's second disturbing observation, that we are all going to die. Humans face the same fate as the animals. Death. All people. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, those who offer sacrifices to God and those who do not. They all share the same destiny. All this activity and madness, then we all join the dead. Man, this book is depressing. And so is the final disturbing thing for the critic, and that is life's random nature. So in Proverbs, life isn't random. There's a clear cause and effect relationship between doing the right thing and being rewarded. But the fact is that life doesn't always work that way. The critic has observed a glitch in the system. He calls it chance, or in his words, The race doesn't always go to the swift or the battle to the strong. Nor does food always come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the educated. Time and chance happen to them all. So his point is that you can't really control anything in life. It's just way too unpredictable. So if I want to master life... Then you're setting yourself up for a fall. Now, throughout the book, the critic uses a metaphor to tie together all of these disturbing ideas. Nearly 40 times, he says that everything in life is hevel. It's a Hebrew word that means smoke or vapor. Like smoke, life is beautiful and mysterious. It takes one shape, and before you know it, it takes a new shape. And smoke looks solid, but try and grab it, it'll slip right through your fingers. And when you're stuck in the thick of it, like fog, it's impossible to see clearly. Now our modern translations have lost the metaphor, and they usually translate hevel as meaningless. But if you read closely, the critic isn't saying that life has no meaning, but rather that its meaning is never clear. Like smoke, life is confusing, it's disorienting and uncontrollable. So... What are we supposed to do with all of this? Well, surprisingly, the critic first of all acknowledges the perspective of Proverbs. He says it's a really good idea to learn wisdom and to live in the fear of the Lord. Really? I mean, he just said that doesn't guarantee success. But he knows it's the right thing to do. But secondly, and more often, he says that since you can't control your life, you should stop trying. Learn to hold things with an open hand because you really only have control over one thing, and that's your attitude towards the present moment. Stop worrying, he says, and choose to enjoy a good conversation with a friend, or the sun on your face, or a good meal with people that you care about. The simple things in life. Yes, and both the good things and the bad, because both are rich gifts from God. And that's the surprising wisdom of Ecclesiastes. Listening to the critic is painful and can lead you into some dark places. And that's why the author speaks up at the end of the book. He doesn't want you to lose hope. He wants to make you humble into someone who trusts that life has meaning even when you can't make sense of it, that one day God will clear the hevel and bring his justice on all that we've done. And so he tells us that the proper response to all of this is to fear the Lord and keep his commandments. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes. Now there's one more voice in the Bible's wisdom literature, and that's the book of Job. And he will bring us the final, much needed perspective on our journey 
into wisdom. I guess you got to come back next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that because of Jesus and his death upon the cross, that the heaven will clear, that all things will be judged, that justice will be done, that meaning will be placed into our existence, into our lives, and one day it'll be clear to us. Father, thank you for this book of Ecclesiastes. Thank you that it was a companion for my friend, Dr. Grotheis, as his wife slipped into dementia and died last year. May we turn to this book with our questions and our doubts, and may it remind us that though we can't understand and don't we, though we don't have answers, we know that you do. Father, Holy Spirit, help us see this and not turn from you, but to turn into for the fear of the Lord. Holy Spirit, make it so. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Read this book. Drink its wisdom down.